everyone. Thank you for coming today to our event. Um, this is hosted by the Animal Law Society and the Animal Law and Policy Program who's sponsoring this event. Um, thank you all so much for showing up. We're really excited to introduce our guests. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Kathy Meyer, who is a uh, clinical instructor director at the uh, Animal Law and Policy Clinic uh, to introduce the rest of the panel. Awesome. Thank you, Arlene. So thank you, everybody, for coming to this important discussion. Uh, as Arlene said, I'm Katherine Meyer. I'm the director of Animal Law and Policy Clinic here at Harvard Law School, where we do advocacy work on behalf of animals, both in the wild and in captivity. And uh, at the outset, before I introduce the panelists, I really want to give a shout out to the uh, students who organized this event. It's a really great event. And uh, the Animal Law Society students, many of whom have also either are currently clinicians in the clinic or <laughs> have been in the past, so good work. So for many years now, there's been a lot of discussion and debate about whether or not non-human primates should continue to be used in biomedical research in this country. And um, several years ago, the National Institutes of Health uh, stopped all such research on chimpanzees. And uh, after that happened, uh, the, chimpan the captive members of the chimpanzee were listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act, which meant that they could no longer be experimented on for these kinds of um, purposes. However, there are several other primate species, uh, principally monkeys, that are still currently being used in research in this country uh, for a wide range of, of, of medical research, uh, much of which is funded by our federal government with your taxpayer dollars. Uh, in October of this, October 2022, it came to light, actually, Catherine Rowe is the one who disclosed this to the public, that there is some particularly, in our view, uh, egregious uh, monkey experiments going on at our own medical school here at Harvard. And um, uh, our clinic has gotten involved in that issue. Uh, in a nutshell, it involves uh, taking infant monkeys away from their, the cats, it's the species, taking them away from their mothers at birth, and depriving them of the ability to see. And that's basically, in a nutshell, what the research is. And we can talk about whether there's any legitimate basis for that. But that sort of got us into this issue uh, most recently. We're doing a bunch of projects in our clinic that involve research on primates. Um, but as a result of that, finding out about that research going on in our own medical school, our clinic got very involved in um, trying to do something about it. Uh, we reached out to the IACOC, which is the Institutional Animal Care Use Committee that is required to, uh, for each research facility, that's required to review protocols and make sure that the research that's being conducted by that facility is compliant with all laws and is humane, et cetera. We reached out to that entity and asked them to please review this, this particular protocol with an eye towards perhaps terminating it. Uh, and we heard radio silence back. Uh, a couple of follow-up emails were also unanswered. So now, uh, earlier today, actually, uh, the clinic, with um, the help of Wild Minds Lab, sent a letter, a formal request to the National Institutes of Health to review that particular research, again, with an eye towards determining whether or not it should perhaps be terminated as not necessary, uh, a waste of taxpayer money, and unnecessarily cruel to the animals involved. Um, so that letter went out this morning. We had over 380 co-signers. Uh, scientists from all over the world, uh, including major leading climatologists and neuroscientists, including James Woodall, for example, um, who signed our letter. So that went off to the NIH this morning uh, with a press release, and you can get a copy of that letter on our website, I'm pretty sure, by now. And um, I've been asked to ask you all if you agree with the sentiments expressed in that letter to please retweet it so that it gets out there as, as widely as possible. So um, that sort of sets the stage for the immediate reason for this panel, but that led us to sort of you know, look more widely at uh, research on primates in general, which is what brought us all here today. And we're really fortunate to have with us an incredibly prestigious panel um, of experts who can discuss this topic. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the panelists, very short introductions, and then um, the panelists themselves have come up with a list of questions they would like to start the discussion with, so I will 
then turn to those questions and ask the panelists their questions, hear what they have to say, and then when we're all done with that, we're gonna open it up for questions. So if you could please hold your questions till we get to that point, that would be great. Um, all right, our distinguished panelists are, we have Catherine Rowe, who I already mentioned. She's a neuroscientist currently working at the PETA Foundation, where she focuses on efforts to end harmful and ineffective neuroscience and psychology experiments on animals. She has more than 20 years experience conducting behavioral and neuroimaging, and she's the scientist who disclosed um, to the public and to us uh, the hard medical experiments that I, I referenced in my intro. So thank you for being here. We have Larry Carbone right here, who is a veterinarian with a lifetime focus on protecting um, welfare for animals in laboratories. He received his veterinary degree at Cornell, where he also obtained a doctorate in the history of science and veterinary medicine. Veterinary ethics, thank you. And we're really, we're really lucky to have him as a visiting fellow in, our, in the Animal Law Policy Program uh, in 2021. So it's great to have Larry back with us. We also have Christine Webb, who is a lecturer and research associate with Harvard's Department of Human Evolutionary Biology. She received her PhD in psychology from Columbia, and uh, where she studied individual differences in reconciliation behavior in humans and chimpanzees. And we have Erin Sharoni, who's currently a master of bio, pursuing her master of bioethics um, at Harvard Medical School. She's our Harvard Medical School representative. <laughs> Don't give her a hard time. She's on the right side. She's a member of the advisory board of uh, Animal Save Movement, a global animal rights organization focusing on ending moral uh, animal exploitation through the act of actually bearing witness. So she's, her current work at the medical school focuses on the moral obligation to, pair, to actually bear witness to animal suffering. So thank you all for coming. And now I want to segue to the questions. I'll start with a pretty general question, uh, which is, what are we talking about here? Who are the primates that we're talking about? We, of course, are all primates. Um, but what primates are we talking about that are involved in this kind of research, and what characterizes the primate order, and how might this be relevant to primate research, and particular scientific and ethical concerns that it raises? Christine, that was your question. Do you want to start with it? <laughs> sure. Do I need, okay. This sounds like it's on. Um, yeah, so indeed, humans are primates. Uh, we're a diverse group comprising some 200 different species from, the, and they range in size from like the pygmy mouse lemur who can fit in the palm of your hand to the mountain gorilla who can grow to be uh, as, as large as over 400 pounds. Um, and other primates um, are humans' closest living relatives. So we share a, a common ancestor. We all share a common ancestor about 60 million years ago, but in the case of chimpanzees and bonobos, that last common ancestor that we share with them lived um, somewhere between five and seven million years ago, which in evolutionary time scales is incredibly recent. Um, I think in the case of, of macaques, it's somewhere like 20 million years ago we share a common. Uh, ancestor with them 20 or 25 million years ago, which is also very, very recent uh, in evolutionary thinking. Um, the oft-referenced statistic is that humans share over 98.6% of their genetic material with uh, chimpanzees and bonobos. In the case of, of monkeys, like macaques, that's also a number that's somewhere above 90%, I think 93%. Um, hallmarks of primate evolution include forward-facing binocular vision, um, kind of adaptations to the hands and feet that allow for grasping objects like opposable thumbs. We have long gestation and developmental periods uh, which facilitate tight mother-infant bonds. We primates um, also lead incredibly rich social lives. We have complex social relationships and systems of conflict resolution to manage those relationships, something I'm particularly interested in. Complex emotions um, like empathy, all kinds of um, complex communication capacities. Um, evidence over the last several decades has clearly indicated that other primates are also um, exquisitely sentient and self-aware um, and have the capacity for tool use and complex cultures and social learning. 
and all of these uh, capacities that we long thought were human unique. So in many ways, I think other primates really kind of blur this supposed boundary between humans and other animals. Great, and what can you, did someone explain us what the current landscape of primate use in this country is? Like how many, for what kind of research, what does it cost the, the public, et cetera, that kind of thing? Kathy? Sure, am I on? Okay, great, yeah. Um, Right now, across the world, we're talking about anywhere between 150 to 200,000 non-human primates that are being actively used in research. Here in the US, we're looking at maybe about the, the monkey share of that, which is about 100,000 animals either being held in laboratories or actively on research protocols. Um, what those experiments entail, uh, the majority of them are for either infectious disease research or neuroscience research. So in, in the former, in the case of infectious disease research, this does usually involve deliberately infecting animals with particular diseases to study how those diseases develop, or in some cases to test vaccines. Uh, for neuroscience research, a lot of that is what we classify as basic science research. So this is really just trying to understand fundamental aspects of the brain. And it tends to be fairly invasive. You know, these are experiments that we can't do in humans because the ethics committees wouldn't allow it and sometimes involves uh, a lot of implantation to lots of surgeries, et cetera. A lot of the times animals, monkeys, um, used in these experiments have to be housed alone. So even though guidelines suggest we socially house primates because they are so social, uh, all of these surgical implants, the effects of brain damage, or the infectious diseases that these animals are suffering with for the purposes of this experimentation preclude them from being socially housed. So we're looking at thousands of very social primates who are often housed alone in very barren environments, unlike what they would, would get to experience in the natural world. And of course, that affects the data. So I just want to point that out, that once you take an animal out of the wild and put them in a lab, regardless of what you're trying <coughs> to test, taking them out of their natural habitat, uh, preventing them from doing any of their natural behaviors affects all of their systems. But most, most affected are their uh, immune systems, which is where they're being studied, and their brain, which is where they're being studied. So basically, the laboratory environment most likely negatively impacts the quality of the data in the two areas that these animals are being used the most. Excellent point, very important point. And can you also spend a couple of minutes just explaining sort of what the regulatory oversight or lack thereof is? Sure, I mean, it's a little bit of both. So, so on paper, in theory, it looks pretty good. You know, I, I did neuroscience research uh, at NIH, who is the funder of most of this here in the US and assumed because of all the paperwork that's involved with experimenting on animals that the oversight was really, really good, that uh, animals were only used in experiments if it was absolutely necessary and somebody was evaluating that. Uh, animals are, are being used with minimally harmful procedures and somebody I thought was overseeing that um, and that it was always going to benefit humans in some way that the data we were getting. So, so right now there are more guidelines for animal use in laboratories. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, primates are supposed to be socially housed, but it's possible to get what are called scientific exemptions. So if you have a, what is the scientific justification for keeping a monkey by himself in a cage, you can get that. Um, you mentioned the ISO already. So at each institute we have one or more than one uh, animal care and use committee who review procedures before they're performed on animals. What an ISO typically doesn't do is evaluate the harms being caused to the animals relative to the benefits. So if you're experimenting on humans, this is something that is necessary. So if you're even, even a non-invasive procedure with, with a human being, <coughs> A, a human volunteer is evaluated by an, an institutional review board. Um, ISOPs do review the procedures, but there isn't a systematic procedure in place to say, well, the, the harms to these animals rank at a nine, and the, the potential benefits rank at a 12, and therefore we should proceed. 
So there is a lot of oversight, but I think that we could see a lot of improvement in that oversight, particularly when it comes to assessing how harmful a series of experiments may be to an animal and whether or not we can truly justify that based on the potential benefit. And we're usually talking about potential benefit. And I just want to amplify um, some of what Catherine said. So the Animal Welfare Act actually does um, require the USDA Department of Agriculture to set standards for the um, humane care of animals covered by that statute. Primates are covered by the Animal Welfare Act. And there's actually a specific provision in the Animal Welfare Act that requires the USDA to promulgate a standard that would quote unquote, promote the psychological well-being of primates. However, as Catherine mentioned, there's also an exception to that requirement, uh, particularly with respect to social housing, which would obviously promote the psychological well-being of primates. There's an exception for um, if, if, if um, socially housing the primates would somehow interfere with the protocol of the scientific uh, uh, research at issue. And in fact, in the Animal Welfare Act itself, Congress made it very clear after much lobbying by the biomedical industry that any standard that would interfere with the protocol of the research uh, it has to fall by the wayside. In other words, protocol trumps these, these, this uh, standard requirement. So the question now is, are there any valid scientific reasons for using primates, uh, either, either because they're primates or instead of other species or non-animal replacements in research in this country? Mary, you want to take that one? <laughs> my notes say that came from you, Larry. <laughs> so, so my background, I've worked with monkeys since I was a kid working at the Franklin Park Zoo down the street when I was 14. And um, I've worked with laboratory monkeys um, for most of my life. Um, and also other laboratory animals. So always when I get this question, I always want to be clear, are we talking about primates as opposed to mice. So is there a goal that we should just get rid of all the monkey labs and do all our work in mice would be happy? Or are we trying to move towards um, sentient animals in general, uh, trying to get all the mammals and the birds and the frogs and the fish eventually one day out of labs? Um, so why do people still use monkeys? Using monkeys is incredibly expensive. Many species of monkeys that are common in labs carry diseases that can kill people that we can't really adequately screen the monkeys for, so we always have to wear PPE long before it became fashionable for COVID. Um, they're expensive. It's hard to get enough numbers of monkeys to do really statistically robust experiments the way you can with mice or rats. Why do we still use monkeys? We use monkeys because they've got that behavioral complexity. So. hoping to extrapolate from. So the last job I had working with monkeys was at University of California, San Francisco, a big medical school, public institution. So if you go to my animal care committee, my IACUR, we were obligated under state law to give these minutes to our meetings, to respond to any records requests we have. Private universities like Harvard are exempt from that, so it's hard to see what's going on at a place like Harvard. Um, so we had animals modeling Parkinson's disease. I'm not sure I was ever convinced that there was a clear step from, oh, we learned this in the monkeys with Parkinson's, therefore we're ready to do this with people. Um, in safety testing, long history why we use two species for most drug safety testing, but it had to do with a case where it looked like mice might have been useful for safety testing for a drug called thalidomide that got into human patients and caused serious problems. And a solution, non-solution to that wasn't to just refine how mouse safety testing was done, but to say, so let's add a second species as well. So keep using the mice and rats, but use a non-rodent like dogs or monkeys. So monkeys are used by the thousands in commercial private labs. So again, no transparency to see what's going 
going on there, mostly to test complicated drugs like monoclonal antibody treatments that are on the increase for cancer or COVID treatments. So those rely much more on monkeys than they would on dogs or pigs or rodents and to test vaccines. Anything with a really big complicated protein molecule probably is going to involve monkeys somewhere along the line. A big open question I cannot get the data on and keep asking people who might. How often do any safety tests that have cleared mice and rats run ashore in monkey labs? How often do we say, well, this looks safe in monkey I mean, mice and rats, but the monkeys were there, thank, thank goodness, because we found out this would be unsafe in people. It's not available knowledge, but I think it's, it's certainly something that needs to be addressed. We have a monkey shortage crisis not really fulfilling a purpose, it's time to say, let's get rid of monkeys from those, those kinds of labs. Aaron, what do you think we owe monkeys, primates, that are being experimented on in these research labs? Yeah, the answer to this question requires 40 days and 40 nights and weeks of, <laughs> of ethical discussion. So that's why I have notes printed out, because I thought, how am I possibly going to communicate all the things I want to communicate? And I would say, just a bit by background, obviously, Kathy noted that I'm, I'm at the medical school, and I see some of my, uh, my classmates here, so thank you for coming. Um, but we're in the bioethics program, and if, if there is a program that should sort of be um, the ethical watchdog uh, of the institution, it should be us. And so I think it's very important uh, for us to think critically and speak up when we think that uh, there's some injustice uh, being done. I also would add that um, I am, I'm not just fresh out of uh, my undergraduate degree. I've had 15 years of work experience, nine of which has been in the biotechnology industry. Uh, and during that time, um, I also was involved in animal experimentation in rodents. Um, I did not do those experiments directly, but um, in some cases uh, helped to design the experiments, so indirectly. Um, and I would still say that I was involved in that's part of what moved me towards uh, the field of, of bioethics and ultimately activism. Um, as Kathy noted, in my work with animal safe movement. So I just want to give that context so that people don't think, uh, you know, not that you should write an activist off, but oh, this person doesn't have any real world, real world experience. I, I, I do, and that's what drove me here, um, and that's why I'm so passionate about it, and I think it's so important, and very appreciative of what the Animal Law Society and the clinic do here. Um, so I mean, I'm going to say at a high level that my answer actually applies to all animals, because I believe all animals deserve moral consideration and have interests and rights. Um, but this is a primate panel. Uh, and so to answer the question most specifically of what do we owe uh, primates, if anything, in biomedical research, I will quote uh, Asia Akhtar, who actually was quoted in the New York Times uh, a few weeks ago. She's the co-founder of the Center for Contemporary Sciences. She's a neuroscientist and formerly with the FDA. And she said, what we owe uh, animals is to legitimately replace their use in medical research. Um, and I would add to that that we owe them dignity and respect that we owe them um, freedom from harm. They cannot consent. Uh, and when we think about primates, you know, as, as Larry pointed out, there's obviously this big paradox here because they're so much like us, yet we're perpetuating these, these harms. And I, I, I think from just purely an ethical perspective, and the, the science does intersect with this on the Venn diagram, but from an ethical perspective, I, I do think it's morally indefensible. Um, it's really difficult to justify the way that we treat other sentient beings, particularly the ones that we have clear empirical evidence for their capacity to suffer. And Dr. Webb can talk much more accurately about this than I can, as can Larry and Catherine. Um, I have not worked with monkeys, but I know that there's, there's very clear evidence of their suffering, uh, particularly when we think about what's happening at the medical school, uh, which is why, why so many of us are involved um, in trying to change that now, because if you think about maternal deprivation and what that might do to a human. Um, does a macaque monkey not feel a fetus growing inside her and form an attachment to it? Does she not grieve for her baby? I mean, these are all things that we're very well aware of. Um, and so there's the question of what are we really learning from some of this research, as Larry alluded to? Um, and then is it ethically justified? And as someone who works in biotechnology and is, has a very big interest um, and, and studying, actually, um, the alternatives to animal testing, right here at Harvard, at the Beast, 
and in other labs, people are developing extraordinarily powerful tools that just require additional funding for validation. And, and yes, animal testing alternatives are not 100% there yet, but they're getting there. And so I would say, let's not be intellectually dishonest with ourselves and say, well, we have to use monkeys because there isn't another alternative. Or we have to use mice because we can't do these experiments in humans, they're agreed, just, just wouldn't pass a sniff test. Um, fine, because we're progressing towards alternatives, but let's not use moral arguments to justify technological and scientific insufficiencies. And that's, that's where I, I really feel very passionate about as someone coming from the biotech sector, is it's okay to say we're not quite there yet, but if we have a moral obligation, including our duties to sentient fellow sentient beings, we have an obligation to urgently replace their use. And that includes admitting that what we're doing is harmful and wrong and is not sustainable. It includes changing funding, and it includes putting additional funding towards validating the new technologies that are being developed here. We should be leaders. I'm very proud to be at Harvard Medical School. There's a lot of really intelligent people in our ecosystem. Um, and, and I think that you should, you should elevate that instead of c continuing uh, to fall back on what the status quo is because the status quo uh, is, is, is not defensible. Thank you. Yeah, one of the points that we make in the letter that we sent out this morning to NIH is, is just that point about the funding of uh, research for alternatives. So we're talking about, I mean, the particular research that um, we address in the letter of the monkey eye experiments going on at, at medical school right now, uh, the researchers received all, about $30 million of taxpayer money to do this research over the years, and she, that's just one research project. So you can just extrapolate, there's a lot of it going on all over this country, and one of the points we make in the letter is, assuming that we're correct, and we think we are, that this research is unnecessary and it's cruel, take that money <laughs> and put it towards alternatives, developing alternatives, which as you said is very expensive, but we, you know, there's a lot of money that's being spent on animal research that isn't really getting us anywhere, and it's causing a lot of harm to the animals involved. So we, we advocate in this letter, um, having NIH concentrate on, you know, focusing that money on, on alternatives. So these are, you talked about the ethical concerns, and Catherine, you talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to know what, what scientific concerns there are about using um, primates in research. Maybe, I don't know, Christine or Catherine wanted to address that? not true in the laboratory environment, and the data consistently shows this, that putting an animal in a cage, taking an animal away from its mother, taking an animal away from their social group, you know, uh, anything from routine laboratory procedures to the more invasive procedures that often go on, alter their behavior and their physiology, so the, the data that we're often getting from these animals won't even apply to their wild counterparts, so it does Additionally, we do talk a lot about genetic similarity, um, but what's become much more apparent is that even if you share 98% of your DNA with another animal, what makes us distinct from even very genetic and similar species is gene expression. And there is a lot of variability across species and gene expression. So sharing 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees doesn't make us as close to chimpanzees as that sounds, because how those genes are expressed over the course of development is different between chimpanzees and us. And as Kathy pointed out at the beginning, eight years ago, the Institute of Medicine conducted a systematic review. This is a very in-depth evaluation of the, the value of biomedical data from chimpanzees, again, our closest living relatives, and made the, the, the excellent decision 
to stop using chimpanzees for that reason. So if chimpanzees, which again are our closest living relatives, aren't giving us the data we need, how can a rhesus macaque, or how can a mouse puma, or how can a marmoset, or a mouse, or a rat, or a drosophila, all of which are animals that are being harmed in laboratories with the justification that somehow it's gonna benefit benefit any one of us. And of course, when you look at drug, drug safety and efficacy, which Larry alluded to is one of the areas where we know they do use monkeys, those failure rate rates are really high. We have measurements on those. We have measurements of drugs that tested safe and effective in non-human animals, including monkeys. And that failure rate is sometimes 100%, depending on, on the type of drug and what disease it's, it was meant to treat. So again, we're using hundreds of thousands of primates across the world. We're using tens of millions of mice and rats here in the US for science that isn't necessarily good science. And it's costing a lot of money, which could be invested in non-animal research. You know, and there are patients. You know, patients are suffering with diseases that we don't have cures and treatments for. Animals are suffering in laboratories, giving us data that might not actually ever be useful. We can do better. Science can do better. You know, and, and I agree with Erin that we have a moral obligation to stop doing harm to these sentient creatures. And we know they're sentient. Do you want to add anything to this one? I mean, yeah, no, I could just reiterate that um, when animals, when other primates are housed uh, in these socially and physically deprived environments and subjected to um, you know, repeated and uncontrollable interventions, their welfare suffers. They develop stress and anxiety, and as Catherine was saying earlier, that affects um, you know, brain function and immune system function. And a core assumption of a lot of biomedical research is that the animal models being studied um, embody healthy biological individuals. And we can't really make that assumption. Um, and, so, and then just to add one more thing is that a lot of scientists really value something called ecological validity, which is the extent to which uh, your findings generalize to real world contexts. And you might have heard that um, in scientific fields like psychology and, and in biomedical studies, we're amid a replication crisis right now, in part because um, of the lack of ecological validity where findings in these highly controlled laboratory environments do not generalize to real world contexts. Um, and I think that's something like as a scientist, I learned throughout my training that being the more sort of control you can have in an environment, the better, right? So that these laboratory conditions allow you to control for all kinds of extraneous variables. And then that can sort of boost your confidence that your result is due to uh, your manipulation and not some external factor. But of course, these environments themselves are harmful to the animals in all the ways that we have already covered. Um, and so that's you know one of the many reasons why in these highly controlled environments, that's not, that's not the real world. Um, and so the, the generalization, the ecological validity, the extent to which these findings generalize to those contexts um, is, is really questionable. The scientific validity is, is questionable given the stress and the anxiety and all the other factors you talked about. What is the industry what is the industry's response to that argument? I want to know. And what is the government's response to that argument? It sounds like you have some great stats about all of this. And what is what is the what is the counter argument to this? Well the counter argument tends to be we're very slow and we're gonna take change. What we what I see all too often is when people are willing to acknowledge the limitations but you often hear the limitations of animal models of, of human physiology or human disease. The translational failure, so the, the inability to get data from a laboratory to translate into a clinical use, um, is they try to make better animal models. So that tends to be where a lot of the, instead of saying, let's invest in human relevant methods, many of which are available, and as you mentioned, many of which are being developed right here, um, it's still, well, let's try to, it's sort of like you need to you need to really buy a brand new car, right? But instead, you're like taping the car together. And it, to me, that's sort of the analogy that I see with animal models. They know that there are so many problems with getting the data to translate it to human health. But instead of 
say, you know what, we need to, we need to, we need to abandon this at this point. We've invested too much time. We've invested too much money. Too many animals are lost their lives. Instead, they're taping it together. You know, there's a, and, and what we really could do is, you know, take all that money that we're trying to tape all these crappy cars with, and you know, buy a Ferrari. You know, which and the Ferrari is between the development research methods, which are available or being developed. Especially for the scientific community, who I would always hope would evolve with new information, but unfortunately, that's not the situation, or it's not what we see as often as I would love. Erin, seemed like you wanted to add something to that. Yeah, no, that's very well said. Um, I think also, and I took this. I did a lot of research before this. And I took this from something that Dr. Wise had written, this wonderful article. I think it was a few years ago, maybe, um, where she said, you know, a lot of science stops short of considering the ethical implications. may find people being able to reverse engineer their way into justifying certain things, but it's very hard to refute the assertion that, that there's something very wrong with this. And so to Catherine's point, we have to dismantle what exists already. Sarah? Yeah, um, I guess I'm more of a medical research insider than, than others here. So not to try to, to set myself up as the defender of, of biomedical research, but I do think should we stop doing animal experiments, recognizing all the problems, and then hope that in a few years all the things we thought we were trying to accomplish with animals, we now have non-animal systems to do it. And what do we do in the meantime? Do we say, well, whatever pandemic comes along after COVID, we've decided we're not using animals, and we're not ready yet with non-animal sit out this pandemic and not try to get the vaccine developed. Or we're going to jump to human studies if we can get volunteers to say, yeah, I'll take that thing that's never been tested in animals before, um, and let's do it. Uh, how do we pick which thing that we're going to test in people if we haven't done some animal studies? So for scientists, they look at an incredible array of successes in medical research. And remember, every success in medical research has come through animals, if only because there's a legal requirement that it go through animals. That's not necessarily a biological or scientific requirement, but I couldn't get this vaccine license because the law told me I have to have my animal data. Still, we have cures for cancers. We have PrEP for HIV prep, uh, prevention. We have COVID vaccines. We have a lot that science has brought us. And we need to decide, are we willing to compromise? You know, how much do we keep riding roughshod over animals to keep getting this medical progress that we want? Um, so yeah, and, and the concern about these are skewed animals that we're working with is very true, which always makes me extra skeptical about anything that has an emotional readout, a behavioral readout, mental health readout for animal models. I'm incredibly skeptical, but I'm trained as a vet, so I tend to think of things like infectious disease. I tend to think of neurology rather than psychology. So a monkey who's not thriving can still give data on when the light shines <coughs> in the eye, this is the part of the brain that lights up positive. So this is highly reductionist thing, is that important information? I'm not the one to make the case it is. 
but is it possibly believable that other than, yes, this is the part of brain that does this. Um, these are some of the neural networks that process that, even in a, a monkey who is unhappy, whose biology is affected by that unhappiness and that stress, there's still ways of, of getting some information out of those. And, and there are other times a friend of mine does diabetes work in monkeys and says, Everybody who grabs a monkey to get a blood sample to test sugar levels in diabetic monkeys, grabbing a monkey and sedating her to do that completely invalidates your data. Training a monkey to prevent an arm to cooperate with the study is a different way. So for scientists, often the response to critiques is, but we could do it better, versus, oh yeah, maybe we should just stop and do something we should always tape it a little bit better, right? <laughs> and, but isn't there also a conflict of interest that's kind of built into the whole system? I mean, these are people who are getting, in, in terms of federal funds at least, they're getting millions of dollars of tax, taxpayer money to do this research. It's, it's, it's unlikely, it's just human nature that they're not going to say, oh, I'm going to stop doing my research that, I, that I'm being funded. Instead of just a panel of diabetes researcher insiders reviewing this grant application, why don't we, if we require IA cooks to have public representation more or less, that could be done better, why don't we have Kathy Meyer on an occasional panel? I'm too busy. <laughs> <laughs> but why don't we have community representatives? Get some diabetes patient advocacy groups, and get some animal advocates on committees and decide if we're going to keep doing this, let's prioritize and let's think differently. Let's make publicly funded science more public. So the next question is, are there viable alternatives to animal research, and what are the pros and cons or obstacles, I guess, to using simply make the ethical decision to stop using primates or all animals in research. That being said, as Larry pointed out, the scientific community and people who are looking for health benefits or are worried about the next pandemic, which might come in on a monkey, um, mm -hmm. would be concerned that maybe we don't have the, the tools available. And it depends. So there are, you know, there's, there's literally millions of different research projects being conducted right now. And in some cases, some of them are easily replaceable with non-animal methods, um, but those investigators may not have the skill set they need. They may have been trained to work with mice, or they may have been trained to work with monkeys for 20 to 40 to 60 years, and so they're reluctant to go and now learn how to use non-invasive imaging with humans, or to learn all of the in vitro systems, really complex in vitro systems that are available and continue to get better and better at mimicking human physiology. Um, I think that collectively, as Kathy pointed out, um, I think, this, this is of course my opinion, that science in, in an academic setting in particular, which is here, which is at all the universities, um, has lost sight of, of the human benefit goal. So it's, it's often thrown out when somebody says, why are you experimenting on animals? How can we experiment on animals? Well, we're, we're, we're helping humans. We're gonna benefit, you know, there's gonna be a new cure for cancer. You know, we're gonna have something for Alzheimer's any second now. That HIV vaccine is around the corner. Um, of course, none of that tends to, to come as quickly as we'd like, um, but I think what's happened, because in an academic position, scientific or not, you have pressure to get your papers published. You have pressure to get outside grant money. And that means getting data out and getting data out quickly. Um, that sometimes comes at a cost for the quality of science. 
some cases you see you know flat out fraud. You know, there's sort of a, a, a lot of discussion in the scientific community in general, independent of animal use or not, about fraudulent images. You know, data that's basically being fabricated to get a publication in a scientific journal. And all of this is because scientists are no longer trying to get not all of them, but a subset of scientists are under so much pressure to get that paper in that journal, to get that grant from NIH, that whether the data is useful or not is almost irrelevant. And that, of course, comes at a tremendous cost to, to the science community as a whole. But we have to consider the animals that are getting roped into this system of just let me get the data out, let me get it published. It's probably never going to help anybody, but, but the Journal of Neuroscience will, will publish it. PNAS will publish it, um, and, and that's a problem that, that's system-wide, but I do think when the lives of other creatures, in this case animals, are, are being directly affected, it's worth considering. You know, that we, we need the scientific community, we need the biomedical research community as a whole to stop focusing on quantity and start refocusing on quality, and, and I would like to hope that that would benefit everybody people looking at these data for answers, and hopefully the people evaluating whether animal data is even worth publishing or funding in the first place. Eric, you want to add to that? Yeah, I agree with everything Catherine said, as I, I usually do. <laughs> but, you know, I would add that pressure that she's talking about, that institutional pressure to, you know, get the tenure track, to publish, 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 to get the next grant. If you took that pressure and made a federal mandate to phase out the use of animals in experiments because it, for no other reason than the fact that it doesn't translate very well to human outcomes and we have, you know, it's imperative that we're able to treat the next pandemic better than the one that we just did uh, and, and, and other diseases, well, then I'm pretty sure that not only with money but with the right pressure and incentive, we're, we're pretty industrious people, we could get there. I mean, validation studies, I don't know who else in this audience has, has been involved in scientific research, they're expensive. Even a small validation study can run you seven to ten million dollars small one and a small company. Um, so, you know, it, it, we need money, but we also need that pressure. And I, I'm not quite sure what incentivizes people outside of potentially, you know, threat of losing their career track, or I'd like to think that people are incentivized by uh, moral interests. Um, that may or may not always be the case. Uh, but I, I, the animals don't care why people stop using them. The animals just care that we, that we stop harming them, right? And then I would also add to Larry's point, which is a very valid one. Um, and I, I, I don't think it's one or the other. You know, even if we're striving for abolition, we have to realize, we talk about this in ethics a lot, that there's the ideal world, but then there's also how do you get to the ideal world? So look, in order to get to animal-free alternatives, we're going to end up killing animals and, and harming them. That, that just is the case, unless there's this paradigm shift and something changes. Um, but I mean, if you just apply like a utilitarian ethic to it, you could very easily say, okay, well, we might you know, harm or kill a million mice today to get to the point where we don't have to use them anymore and then we'll spare a billion. So, I mean, even a very simple rubric can sort of get you there. Um, but I do think it's important to, to, to acknowledge that that it's not 100% um, effective, those alternatives yet. So we, we, we do have to take that into consideration. But pressure is important. And it does seem like there's a bit of a policy shift going Especially in the realm of safety testing, there's a brilliant campaign in New York seven nineties, I think, um, where an activist, not a scientist, got wind of what happened to rabbits in safety testing for things that could go in eyes, whether it's makeup, contact lens solution, whatever. And through his activism, really pushed scientists, uh, pushed the cosmetics industry, pushed the chemical industry to fund research and alternatives talk about cruelty-free cosmetics, there aren't a whole lot of 
cruelty included cosmetic because it's state of the art now. You, you don't test stuff for eye safety in rabbits anymore, or mice, or rats. We have synthetics, we have tissues. Um, if you're going to go for something in animals for safety testing, that's um, already you don't do you don't go to the animals until it's already shown to be safe in non-animal systems. That's a major change from, from 40 years ago. Why would the drug companies or the cosmetic companies want that? It's cheaper for them, better public relations for them. It probably at least is accurate because nobody had to measure that, that talks, testing LD50 tests in mice or Dre's tests in rabbits were all that accurate in the first place. Um, so there's, in some areas, incredible problems. Even the animal projects I review, except for monkey neuroscientists, <laughs> always <laughs> get parallel work in tissue culture. Now, how do pancreas cells react to uh, insulin and glucose? Um, so there's incredible use of non-animal stuff, but still don't. I think this is a good place to, uh, to end the questioning and open it up to the audience. Um, so questions? Anybody?